Oh wait, Neil, Neil. Hello everyone and welcome to day one of Bright Pathways. My name is Sakshi Jaju and this is Ling Shan Zhang. And we are the co-founders of Bright Bears Info. Today, two, we have two amazing guests who are both in or were in university from the engineering field. Ling Shan, why don't you explain who we are and what we do? So for anyone who, do who doesn't already know us, we are Bright Bears Info. Bright Bears Info is a student-led nonprofit organization. Our mission is to provide high school, high school students around the world with resources that will help them reach their full potential. We know that high school can be a pretty challenging time and finding time to look for opportunities may be difficult, especially during the pandemic. Hence, we created Bright Bears Info. Here we'll be now showing you our Instagram page and on our Instagram page, we post opportunities that will be beneficial to high school students and to learn and gain experience from them. So this summer, we have created back Bright Pathways, a webinar series to help with career exploration and to help make student life better. So for every Saturday for four weeks in a row, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will invite special guests to provide insight about university and special fields. So now we will be showing you our YouTube channel. So we will be posting a recording of all of our webinars and future events on our YouTube page. So be sure to check it out after this webinar. So now we'll be showing you our YouTube introduction and we hope you enjoy it. you enjoyed our introduction video and be sure to check out Bright Bears Info on YouTube, Spotify, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. First, we will introduce our guests, Irush and Tammy. Then we'll jump right back in for a live Q&A session. In this webinar, you, you can get a chance to ask engineering students any questions you have about life on campus, applications, extracurriculars, why they chose their specific program, factors to consider, and etc. Please make sure to stay on mute and keep your cameras turned off the entire time for minimal distractions. And type any questions you have for them in the chat, which you should be able to see on your Google Meet. Please do not spam the chat and don't ask questions that have already been answered. So right now you guys can start rolling in the questions in the chat box you can ask any questions for Iruj and Tammy, just make sure that they are appropriate. So let's start by having our guests introduce themselves briefly. So Iruj and Tammy, can you please explain who you are, what university you attend, what year you are in, what your program is, and why you chose your program and your university? I'll go first. Um, so hi, my name's Iruj and I went to the University of Waterloo I studied computer engineering and just graduated in April 2020. Um, I chose computer engineering because I had taken a couple of computer science courses in high school and just really enjoyed it. So, um, so that's why I applied for that. But then I was also interested in the hardware aspect. So I thought computer engineering was probably the best program to give a shot. Um, and yeah, I ended up going to Waterloo just because of like the reputation and I had heard a lot about like the co-op program. So that's why I chose it. All right, and my name is Tammy. I go to McMaster University. I'm a second year student in biomedical and software engineering. And I chose my program because I'm personally really interested in medical sciences. And I also really love problem solving. So my program just checked off a lot of boxes in that area. Um, I was also really interested in the project-based learning course that they had for my program. 
And the reason why I decided to come to McMaster was mostly for my program and also because McMaster is really good at fostering a really welcoming student community. So that was really nice to like be able to ask upper years any questions and they'll be like happy to answer you. Yeah. Wow, okay, that's great. So the first question we have is, describe a typical day in your life, like classes, what you do, and student life in general. Okay. Do you want to take this first? Because you're in <laughs> the program right now. <laughs> yeah, I can take this one first. So def it definitely has changed a lot since we have gone online due to the pandemic. But I can say from my experiences last year, um, if, you, if I were to describe a typical day, let's say we have 14 hours in a day where we're awake. Uh, you can expect to have like around, it definitely depends on your schedule, but you can expect to have around like five hours of classes in a day. So right in the morning, you might wake up, go to classes. Then for me, I might spend like an hour for lunch, hanging out with my friends, then go to more classes. And then after my classes, I might um, have like dinner with my friends or just hang out with my friends for like an hour or so. And then I would spend the rest of the night doing homework personally because I just like doing my homework at the end of the day. So I might spend like two or three hours a day doing homework, maybe more if we're close to a deadline. Um, okay, so my experience I would say was a bit different. Um, for me, first year, um, so we didn't actually get to choose any electives until second year, second term. So first year, um, we all had the exact same courses and it was basically like an eight hour day. Um, it was always like from eight to four and you would get one like lunch break, an hour lunch break in between. Um, but it was honestly like just in terms of the schedule, it was just like high school. Um, eight to four classes back to back and then one hour lunch break. And then after that, um, normally just like reviewing notes or working on labs and projects. Um, so that was like first year, but first year and most of second year. Um, in third year, there was a lot more flexibility in terms of what you take and then a lot less hours of classes as well. Um, so it definitely does get better after that. But I think first year, just a very structured um, lifestyle. Okay. Um, can you guys um, explain like the environment at your school? Okay, um, <laughs> I guess I can take this first. Um, so I think the environment in my class, um, so basically for me, I was with the same group of people throughout the five years. So I think you become really like there were obviously people who either like dropped out or switched programs. But for the most part, um, I was just with one class. It was a cohort of about like 130 people. Um, so I think the environment like you get very used to the people and you know each other pretty well by the end of fi the five years. Um, you also make a lot of close friends. And honestly, like I feel like there's a lot of group work in engineering through labs and even just like homework or assignments. Um, so I would say that the environment is pretty good. Like obviously it can get competitive, but for the most part, everyone's like really close and always willing to help each other out. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that the environment was good. I think the environment at McMaster was a little different. So um, because McMaster for your engineering programs, including, so I was in the biomedical engineering program. So that's like iBiomed, but there's also a general engineering program called Eng1 at McMaster. And in first year, all of our courses are general and you don't specialize into a stream of engineering until second year. So since you have a really large group of engineering students, the biomedical and um, general engineering students all take the first general core courses. There was a lot of us to meet in first year. So um, in lectures and stuff, you could say that it wasn't as like close knit a community, but within like biomedical engineering, there was still small communities there. And then within our labs and stuff, there are still really small groups there. So there's lots of opportunities to meet lots of different people. And um, again, like I said earlier, McMaster is really good at fostering a really helpful and welcoming community. So even within upper years, if you ever see upper years on campus, they're always help like they're always willing to help you out. So overall, I would say the environment's really nice and friendly. 
Oh. I guess just to bounce off of that, um, I did forget to mention that like in Waterloo, you specialize in first year. So mm -hmm. all the people that I mentioned that were in my class, they were all like also computer engineers and yeah. Oh, wow. So we actually got a question from the chat. So the question is, what are some important things you guys considered when applying to your school? I can take this question first. Okay. Um, so for me personally, I actually wasn't thinking about going into engineering when I was applying for my programs. So what really drew me towards applying for this program or choosing this program was really thinking about what the courses were that I would have to take and what I was really interested in. So like I said earlier, uh, I'm really interested in medical sciences. So in high school, I applied for a lot of life science programs, but looking at the courses for the program that I chose, there would be a lot of like maths and a lot of um, physics and stuff. And I really liked that like problem solving type of aspect. I also briefly mentioned this earlier. Um, my program has a really unique course, which is just prob or unique to our school at least. Um, it's a project based course. So throughout the years, throughout the year, you are working on a whole bunch of different projects. And this is kind of put into a real world type of setting. So you're given a patient who has a condition and you have to design something for them. And I found that to be really, really interesting. So just to summarize all of what I just said, really looking at what the courses you have to take and what interests you a lot is really good to look at when you're looking for a program. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I agree with all of that. Um, I think for me, I, so like, because I had actually gotten the chance to take some computer science courses, I already, knew what program I wanted to be in. But in terms of universities, I did, um, like, I applied to so many, and I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go. Like, obviously, like, Waterloo, U of T, McMaster, like, those were my top three. But even, like, beyond that, I applied to so many. Um, I don't know if it was lack of confidence or just genuinely not knowing, like, um, what's for me. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, keeping your options open is probably really important because a lot of things can change from the time when you apply, which I believe is December, um, to the time where you have to make that final decision. So like if you have the resources available, apply to whatever you think you like might be interested in. Oh, so since you guys had to like apply so early on, is there anything that you regret from like your experience applying or any decisions you made in the like process? Um, I think for me, um, decisions I made I think one um, sort of thing that I might have done is to be more diverse with the programs I applied to um, just because even like I remember by the end of grade 12 I was still kind of questioning like oh my god like is computer engineering is programming for me but I was like at the time of applying I was so set on one thing um, so that could be one thing but I'm not entirely sure I would do anything differently um, probably would still have taken the same path yeah I kind of feel like the same way. Like, I don't really know if I, like I quote unquote, like regret anything about my entire application process. I think maybe I would have prepared a little more for my supplement supplementary applications because they did have a practice portal open for like practice interview questions. So maybe I would have done that a little more, but I still think that I would have still chosen the program that I am in. Um, bouncing off from that, how did you guys make your application stand out? It's been a while for me, so <laughs> why don't you go? I can take this one first. <laughs> okay. um, so really, I think you'll hear this from a lot of people, but uh, it's really all about like seeing who you are. So it's really important that you're just yourself. I think when you are yourself, it kind of takes some of the stress off of the application Anyways, like obviously can't take away all of the stress. Applications can be stressful, but just being yourself because uh, in your application, they really want to see who you are outside of your academics. So that's okay. all I really have to say. I can't comment too much on like the application specifically for this year because I do know that it kind of changes from year to year. But I do know that uh, typically there has been a like a video interview and different questions that you answered throughout this platform called Kira. And 
And just to ask you questions about perhaps like your experiences. I think one of the interview questions last year was what was your favorite ice cream flavor? So this is really about who you are outside of your academics. So just be yourself. Okay. Um, I think so just bouncing off of that. Um, so I think that the process for Waterloo has changed a lot from when I applied like six years ago. Um, so I think that they also do some like video questions now. Um, but one of the things that I believe that they still do is an AIF. Um, so just like a bunch of like written questions and answers. Um, so one of, I think like one of the most telling questions that sort of like sh sort of shows your personality. Um, so one of the exact questions was, can you like talk about an article or a book that you read recently um, that you found interesting? And I think it was only like less than 500 words. Um, so I think with questions like that, don't try to um, think of like a very common topic. I think like talk about something you're truly like passionate about or something that really interests you. Cause I feel like people can see through that, like the admissions uh, people, they can see through you trying to impress them versus you actually being passionate and interested about something. So um, yeah, so I think when you're answering stuff like that, just be yourself and like talk about things you're genuinely into. Okay, so a question from the chat is, were you in any programs during high school, such as IB or AP, and was it worth it? I wasn't. So. Oh. Personally, I was not either. Um, um, I, from my understanding of like IB and AP courses, I, like for my peers in my program who have taken those courses, I, I do generally know that they have learned a couple of things like ahead of us. So like there are topics in calculus that I didn't learn in grade 12 that they have. And I guess that probably helped them get a good mark in there or like with their understanding there. But I don't think it was necessarily like I don't regret not having taken those like programs. Now that you mentioned it, actually, I do remember in first year <laughs> um, we were learning integrals. And for some reason, I could not wrap my head around it. It was confusing. <laughs> there were like so many other courses. And a lot of the people that did uh, that were in like IB programs, they had done it all. So that course specifically was like really easy for them. So I do think it can help in certain ways. But I mean, like at the end of the day, like I made it through too. So as long as you like work hard, um, you can figure it out. But in some ways it does make it easier. Oh, on top of that, I do know that some people who took like AP courses that weren't core courses like math or science. Um, like for example, if you took like AP philosophy, they're able to use that as one of their elective courses. So then you wouldn't have to like pay to take another course in that year, you have that credit too. So that might be another perk you might like. Um, um, so, so like, yeah. if you didn't take these courses, you're like, you're not really losing on on much, but it's safe you did, then there's always advantages, right? I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you, do you think um, taking these courses, like AP or um, IB courses, do you think they help with the application process? No, like, I don't I, think so. I don't think so either. Because <laughs> there are a lot of people in my program who haven't taken AV, like AV or IV courses. Same here, yeah. Okay, so then the next question is, I think this is for Iruj. So th they're asking, how does the co-op program work at Waterloo? Okay, um, so the co-op program is very hectic. Um, there were basically in first year, first term, all of the computer engineers, so like all um, about like, I, uh, I don't know the exact number, but maybe like 400, 500 um, are all together that first year, first term. And after that, you branch off into two different streams uh, where one group immediately enters co-op that second term, whereas another group does eight months. And then we keep alternating between four months school, four months co-op. So the exact way that it works is every study term, um, like two weeks into the study term, you start applying for jobs. Um, they have a portal and it has a bunch of jobs and it's actually really good. Like you have so much flexibility and a lot of choice to pick from. Um, so then throughout the term, like, so the first two weeks you start applying and there's a specific weekend slot where you have to send out all your applications. Um, from my time, we only got 50 applications 
for that first round. Um, so you apply, you start interviewing throughout the term too. They, Waterloo has a building um, specifically for interviews. So you go to that one location called Tatum Center. Um, all the interviews are done there. So you don't have to like go out of your way or um, you don't have to go like on site to Toronto or like wherever the job is. Um, so yeah, you apply and then if you don't find anything in the first round, there are also multiple rounds after that. Um, I do feel like they try to like ensure that you find a co-op. Um, so there are many rounds. I think you have a lot of opportunities, some great companies. Um, there are startups as well. So like whatever you're interested in, I do think there are many opportunities to go in into it, um, especially for like specifically like computer science, computer engineering, software engineering. There are a lot of software jobs. Um, so like I do know other engineers that like struggle may have struggled a bit more than people in my class just because there are less jobs. Um, but I think if you're going into like one of those fields, it's a growing field and there are many opportunities in it. Oh, that's, yeah. that's cool. So um, wait, Tammy, is there something like similar to a co-op program at McMaster? Yeah, we actually do have a co-op program at McMaster for engineering as well. It's like engineering specific. Of course, it's not as well known as the Waterloo program because everyone knows the Waterloo program. But um, the way that the McMaster uh, co-op program works is that it's really flexible. So we have, uh, similar to Waterloo, we have a online job searching portal where, where you can like look for positions and you can apply for positions that are four month terms, um, eight, month ter eight month terms or six, 12 or 16 month term. So it's a lot of flexibility in how long your term can be. And what you do is that you either find a job through the job portal or you find a job by yourself and you register it as a co-op. And you can do it whenever, as long as it's before your last year of graduation. Yeah. Um, I guess just to bounce off of that as well. Um, mm -hmm. So ours were like the stream I was in was like four months co-op, but you could um, sometimes in job openings, they'll mention they want like an eight month and you need five out of six co-ops to graduate. Uh, you can do all six or you can choose to do five and like relax for four months if you want. Um, but basically you can also like extend, like there's a lot of flexibility. Say if you find a position that's eight months, but your section is only like four months, you can choose to like delay um, graduation by a year and take that one that eight month if like you're really into it. So um, yeah, there's flexibility in terms of like how long you wanna be doing co-op. Another thing I just wanted to add on for McMaster is um, the four month co-op terms are only during the summer. So if you wanted to do like an eight month or 16 or 12 month term, that'd be like throughout the school year overlapping into the summer if that's the time frame that you need. But four months is strictly for summer. And another thing, I guess I'm just gonna plug this as well since McMaster really, really likes to plug this in our co-op, but apparently we have really good relations with Tesla and um, Tesla or McMaster is Tesla's choice of um, student university to employ students from. That is what I hear. So just shameless plug over there. <laughs> um, okay, so then uh, we, have a, we have another question from the chat. So can you switch specializations between years? Like in between years, can you switch specializations? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know at McMaster, I, I don't have personal experience with this yet because I'm only in second year, but I hear that um, you definitely can. It, you might need to like retake some courses so it, it might extend your time at school a little bit, but you definitely can. All you have to do is talk to your academic advisor and then they will help you sort things out. Um, so for me, it depends. Um, so the three engineerings that all, so like all of first year, the computer engineers, electrical engineers, and software engineers take the exact same programs. So say if you're in electrical engineering and you realize, oh, like I don't like hardware, I wanna go into computer engineering, it's very easy for you to switch. You just tell them like your grades really don't matter because you've taken the exact same courses. So that switch can be really easy. Um, but so that's for like first and second year. 
but when you get to third and fourth year, it is a lot more difficult um, just because at that point you've like branched out and taking different courses. Um, so I feel like if you get past like the first year point, then you do need like high grades and you also um, will probably end up like a term or so behind or like overloading your terms, which can get quite difficult. Um, but just in, yeah, I'm not entirely sure about like whether or not you can switch from like computer engineering to like chemical engineering, because I think at that point you take many different courses from the start. Um, so that might be a little different and you might have to redo many things. Yeah. Oh, so like you have to have like the prerequisites to like be able to switch specializations, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or if you don't have the prerequisites, you can go back and take them if you really do want to switch into a different stream. Yeah. So um, either way, if you want to switch specializations, you're able to, even if like you might be a few years behind or something. Yeah. But um, some things are conditional upon, like depending on grades as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you guys think anyone is capable of being an engineer? Like anyone? Um, okay, so I guess I'll take this first. Um, I think, I think engineering can be very hard, but I also think at the same time, if someone's willing to put in the work, um, then they can make it through. Like, don't, like, you're gonna have multiple breakdowns throughout undergrad, it's inevitable, <laughs> okay? But like, if you're someone who can like push through it and keep trying, like, I believe you can graduate. Like I have friends who unfortunately like dropped out early on, but they people normally drop out because they realize they really don't like it. Like they don't drop out because it's hard. They just drop out because they realize they don't like programming or stuff like that. But I feel like anyone who has the like the tiniest bit of interest, you can work hard and like graduate. Yeah. So I think it just depends on interest and like perseverance. I think that was really well said and answered. I, I do really think a really big part of this would be like, do you like it? Like, do you like core behind engineering, which is like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I really do think engineering is a lot about like problem solving, trying to like help others in society because that's one of like the core principles of engineering. So if that's something that you really like and you think you want to work towards it, it might help if you like math and stuff like that. I think you can do it, as long as you like it. That's the most important thing. Okay, so the next question is, how do you find a healthy school and life balance in you in university? Wait, do you, no, sorry. Okay, do you find a healthy school life balance in university difficult to maintain? Tammy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can take this one first. <laughs> um, I think it really does, depend on the person. So if I'm answering this like personally, um, I've always found that like for myself, it's really easy for me to like say, oh, I'll just keep studying and like ignore my social life, which is not really good for like a healthy school life balance. Um, what it comes down to in my opinion is really time management. I think it's not only important to like schedule times where you like need to do your work, it's also important to schedule a time that you have off so that you know that you're like having that school life balance. I would say it definitely is something you have to work through during first year, but once you get the hang of it, it you like you start rolling with it. <laughs> um, okay, so I think for me, um, so I'm gonna answer like sort of an unrelated question first. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, from high school to university, one thing a lot of people don't realize is in university, you might think you have no homework, but you always have homework. Like th there's always homework. Um, the thing is in high school, you're given assignments, or you're given very specific problems to do, right? So the first time, like, uh, so like the first month of university, I genuinely thought I had no homework because no one was telling me to do anything. Um, like they would just like you would review a topic and I would just sort of like oh like review my notes and call it a day 
um, this was like the first month where I just felt like I had no homework because <laughs> no one was telling me to like do problems or anything, right? That is such a good point. <laughs> yeah. So even if, and then I learned the hard way because like midterms came along and I realized I did not know much. Um, like I might know what like the notes are on, but when you're doing problems, that's a very different experience than just understanding notes. Um, so I guess like what I'm trying to say is there's always homework. So don't think like, oh, you can spend all your time. Like you have so much free time. Like for me, I spent eight to four in school. And then I thought like, oh my God, I have the entire evening. I'll spend one hour reviewing my notes. And like, that's it. Um, that is not the case. You always have work. You should always be doing problems to keep up because th those are the problems that are going to prevent you from freaking out when midterms come along. Um, so I think for me, it was like very difficult, like first year and um, first term of the second year. Those that like for me personally, it was very difficult because I felt like I was just always studying. Um, but the one good thing is uh, because everyone in my class um, was pretty much also the same way. I was still able to make a lot of good friends just over like the mutual bond of we have to go to the library after class. And you'd be surprised how like, I know a library is supposed to be like a quiet place, but like I made amazing friends. And to this day, even after graduation, I'm in touch, we hang out. Um, so I think you make friends, but like not in like the traditional aspect of like having similar hobbies or similar values, but more just like, because you're experiencing the exact same thing. Um, so I do think like for me, it was hard to maintain the two, but still like through that, I feel like I made a lot of good friends. It's just our most common hobby, at least that first year was mm -hmm. like studying. Um, so yeah, I do think you can maintain it though, if you're smart and you know how to like balance your time. Yeah. I just wanted to add on as well. You definitely don't have as much free time as you think, but yeah. just because of that, um, like, don't think that you don't have any time at all to socialize because, like, in a day, you're probably going to eat. So you can really make use of, like, the times you're having meals, like lunch or dinner, to, like, use that time to socialize with your friends. Because if if you're not, like, super stressed out, like, before a midterm or something, chances are you aren't going to be studying the same time you're, you're eating anyways. So might as well use that time to catch up with friends and then do your studying in the other time that you have. And I'm also, sorry, just to just talk <laughs> Um, and I'm also like right now, I'm only like specifically talking about first year. I think like that's the hardest in terms of transition. But after that, like fourth year, I feel like I had so much free time just because you get used to it and you understand the sort of stuff you need to learn um, in order to like do good and like not stress out too much. Um, so it does get better. It's just that first year can be like confusing and difficult. Mm -hmm. Wait, I actually have a question for Tammy. Mm -hmm. So. How do you think the school life like balance changed once the pandemic started? And now that you're like at home or like by yourself more of the time, how do you think that has like changed? Well, it definitely feels now that there's less social time. <laughs> like I still do talk to my friends like over like Messenger or like Instagram or whatever. But since we don't really like meet in person anymore, I guess it seems like there's less of that. Um, I can say that it feels like I have more time because I don't have to spend time traveling between classes. Yeah, I, I think that's the biggest change for me, aside from like doing online lectures and stuff. It does seem like we have more time to do work. I don't know if, if this is just like an illusion since it's only been the first week of school and we haven't had like too many assignments anyways. Generally, it feels like there's a little more time in my school day. Um, okay. Um, okay, so the next question is, would doing a prerequisite for biomedical engineering such as physics through e-summer school affect the viability of that credit when applying to universities? Or just in general, like doing a prerequisite to like a program in summer school affect like the credit when applying to university? Um. Okay, so this is like, like, again, like six years ago. But yeah. from what I heard at that time, um, I did hear that like some universities prefer um, no summer school and just like within um, like the school term. Yeah, I'm not super sure on the answer to that question. I think that's a really great question to bring towards like university representatives at like, um, I think they're gonna have the university fair like online this year. So that's a really great question.
question to ask like university reps at university fairs or at like uh, university open houses. Oh, okay. So the next question is, when is a good time to start applying for scholarships? So like during the year, I guess, when do you think is a good time to start applying for scholarships? And did you guys receive any scholarships or like, um, did you apply to any? Did you receive any? And when's a good time? Okay, I'm not really sure about this, so. Okay, yeah, I can take this question because I applied for a lot of scholarships in grade 12. So you can actually start applying for scholarships at the beginning of the school year. So there are a lot of different scholarships that are out there. And I'm not just, I'm not just talking about scholarships that are specific to your school, because I know at least at McMaster and I'm sure at like Waterloo and different schools as well, they have scholarships specific for like students at at your pro um, students within a program or students at your school so those typically don't open until later on in the year i believe i know that specifically for mcmaster engineering they have a scholarship deadline which is typically in february so that's something you might want to look out for but um otherwise there are external scholarships uh, scholarship opportunities that are available throughout the school year so I actually just recently received a notification about the Loran Scholar Program, which is one of the biggest scholarship programs in Canada and applications for those have just opened. So if you wanted to apply for those, you can. Um, a couple really big scholarships in Canada are the TD Scholarships for Community Leadership, um, the Schulich Leader Scholarship, uh, those ones open pretty early. So I would say fall of whenever you're applying for university. Yeah, you can really apply for scholarships throughout the year. Um, what you can do to find scholarships is go on scholarship searching websites such as Scholar Tree is a really good one that I like. There's also Yconic and Scholarships Canada. So just looking around at those, you'll see that there's scholarships all year round that you can apply for. And if you want like financial aid, you should always, even if you're not taking OSAP, like make sure to make sure to apply for the grants. Um, like that's always a good idea. Um, also, like I know Waterloo gives um, bursaries every term. So if your family is like a low income family, it's actually a pretty significant amount, which is good. Oh, also uh, for McMaster scholarships, we also have a lot of entrance scholarships, which are just based on academic merit. So whatever your final average was in high school, you can get a scholarship if you're in like the top, like if you have an 80% average or higher, a 90% average or higher, or 95% average or higher, there are different scholarships for those as well. Um, okay, let's talk about high school now. Um, what was the, oh, hold up. Um, do universities look at grade 11 marks? Like, do they really matter as much as they say it does? Um, I do think so. Um, I'm saying this because, um, so I applied, we all applied in December and I heard back fairly early in February. Um, so like during the first round, like the early admissions. Um, so I heard back in February, but the only reason I know that they looked at grade 11 marks was because in grade 12, my first term, was very chill. I didn't have more than half of the re uh, required courses to enter the program. So I knew that they couldn't have accepted me just based on my first term's marks. Um, so that was like a pretty sure guarantee that they looked at my grade 11 and then, um, yeah, and then just accepted me based on the fact that they assumed I would continue. And then you also do have to maintain a certain average um, to keep that offer. So I couldn't exactly just start slacking after that either. I think it really does depend on the school and depends on the program because I know for for a fact my program and the health science program at master they don't release any early applications so they release all of the, not applications offers they release all of their offers at the same time in May unless you're you receive the scholarship then you might receive your offer earlier so they definitely only look at your grade 12 marks but that being said I know that I got a couple early offers as well and those probably looked at my grade 11 marks. So it really does depend on your program and your school. 
Okay, so again, following with the high school um, questions, so what extracurriculars did you do throughout high school? Or what were your like main extracurriculars that you talked about when applying to university? Okay, so, yeah. Uh, go. yeah, I can go ahead since high school is more recent for me. Um, well, in high school, I was involved with uh, DECA, which is a business club at my school. Uh, as well as HOSA, which was a health science competition club at my school as well. I was also involved with my student, with my school's student council, as well as at one point uh, music and being a math tutor. But all in all, I would say for the application to engineering at McMaster, I didn't really have a chance to tell them all about all my extra extracurriculars. Because unlike Waterloo's, I think they have, was it called the IAF? AIF, yeah. Yeah, like I believe that's where you can talk about your extracurriculars, right? Yeah. So McMaster only had the online interview platform thing where you do an online interview and you type out questions. So there, um, there was an opportunity to answer their questions with the context of your extracurriculars, but you didn't really get an opportunity to opportunity to list them all out. So in terms of applications to my program, I don't think extracurriculars were a really, really big part of that. Of course, mentioning them in your in your answers really would have helped your application. Um, I think where extracurriculars really helped out though was in scholarships, because if you're applying for scholarships with the Faculty of Engineering, uh, they do give you that opportunity to list your extracurriculars. Also for a lot of external scholarships, they ask you for your outside of academics experiences. So that's a really great place to talk about your extracurriculars as well. Um, I think for me, I'm probably not the best representative <laughs> for like how the, the, like, the world is now. Um, I was in no extracurriculars. Um, AIF, I did, it did have a section to mention what extracurriculars you were in. I was not in any, so I did not put anything. Um, however, I like that's very unrealistic now. Um, I do know that it's gotten much more competitive than it was six years ago. Um, so it definitely would be beneficial to like join clubs, probably the ones that Tammy has mentioned. I've heard a lot about mm -hmm. DECA. So like, um, yeah, so I like I wasn't in any, but I don't think um, that's something you guys should be doing. Yeah. Okay. So you would recommend like for students nowadays to Definitely also focus on school, but also focus on a few extracurriculars, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, we should have answered this question like at the start, but um, can you guys explain the difference uh, between software and computer engineering? I wish. Um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take this one. Um, oh, thank you. For, for <laughs> um, okay, so... I really don't understand, but first year, both software and computer took both uh, uh, took both like programming classes, but then also electrical classes. Um, so at that point, I was like pretty confused, like what is the difference? But after you actually get more electives um, and like the actual like core courses, uh, software they they have a lot more programming courses, whereas we continue to also have electrical courses. Um, so I think that's a major difference. But if I'm being completely honest, both software and computer engineering people, they ended up going for the exact same jobs, which were just like programming jobs. Um, and then mostly electrical people got like the hardware jobs. Um, so I think like in terms of jobs, um, like you end up you end up like being together, like being with like software people and computer. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree with that. And I also think that it very much varies depending on the school that you're in. Because I know the computer engineering like program at McMaster is probably very different from the computer engineering program at Waterloo. On the on terms of software, since that's the program that I can speak on, I have heard from upper years that it's a lot of uh, learning how to structure your code other than like rather than actually like programming. So I am not completely sure if that's the same thing in computer engineering, but I can imagine that they probably don't focus as much as that because they also have to take like hardware courses as well. Yeah, that could be true. I can't speak because I don't know the exact <laughs> courses they took, um, but that could be true. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Um, okay, the next question is, what was the biggest change from high school to university? I think going along the lines of what we said earlier, I think you brought up a really great point about the not being assigned homework and thinking you have a lot of free time. So I think at least for my first year experience, which I I think it was a little different from Waterloo because my schedule was not as structured. It just felt like I had a lot of time. So like I would have like a time slot between two courses where I'm just free. So I feel like that's free time. So it just feels like your day is less structured, at least in my experience. So it didn't really seem like I had to do everything like uniformly. Like at this time I had to eat lunch. No, I could not eat lunch if I wanted to, but it's like up to me now. So there's a, like a lot of freedom I feel going from high school to university. Um, yeah, just along like the same lines. Um, I think the biggest difference for me was um, like living on residence. Um, so obviously I lived at home for like however many years up until high school. Um, and then just realize, so I don't know if that's a mistake, but like I made the mistake of having roommates that weren't in engineering. So they had very flexible schedules as less so like I had to wake up early, like every single day, 8 a.m. Right. Um, whereas they didn't. So they were up really late. Um, so I was struggling with that because obviously when you're living in a place with other people, it's like difficult to fall asleep or just like, I don't know, just find like a place to study or whatnot. Like normally I was always a homebody. Um, I would just come home in my room, study. But like I was having a hard time doing that when you live with other people who don't really understand what you're going through. Um, so I think stuff like that was definitely the biggest challenge. And I didn't really have any friends either going into university. Um, well, I, like I had high school friends, but I didn't have any in university. Um, so definitely, I think just like getting out of my shell of not being able to talk to people and then like going out of my way and being like, I have to make friends because I don't know anyone here. So that was probably the difficult, the most difficult and biggest change for me. Mm -hmm. Also to like continue like the question, did you guys choose to um, live on residence or like at home or in a house or like what was your living situation like in university? Yeah, uh, personally, I lived on residence. I lived in a apartment style residence. So I had my own single room, but it was within an apartment that had like three other people living there. And we all shared a washroom within the suite and a kitchen. Um, so I lived on residence, but it was actually like townhouse residence. So it was like Waterloo's thing. It's just that it was a little farther. So the walk ended up being like a bit longer. Um, so it was like a house, but it was like I was still living on res um yeah so i had my own room uh so like a little more privacy um in comparison to like traditional dorms yeah um okay so a question from the chat is how many classes were there in one program um so first so for me it was five five per term where one was kind of like like a wishy-washy like mm -hmm. not a lot of work required um yeah so five uh for me it was five in my first semester and then six in my second semester and i think going up into upper years it's more consistently like six per semester i think um okay so the next question is um how did you guys prepare for your video interviews or your interviews or if you did do them? Like if you guys yeah. did any interviews? Yeah. They didn't um, exist when I prepare? applied, so. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I, I can take this. Okay. <laughs> so um, for the like the video interviews that I had to do for my program, it was through this um, platform called Cura. So before I had to submit the application, they sent out like the website, the website link to the platform. So you can like go onto that and log into your account. And then there they would have a practice platform for you to use. So they had a bunch of practice questions. You can practice using the program so that like the thing that messes up your, inter like your application wouldn't be not knowing how to use your program. And hopefully you don't mess up your application. Didn't mean to like say it like that, but um, yeah. So a really, really a lot of preparation 
you can do is by practicing. And just, I think a helpful tip might be if you have extracurricular experiences, you can like write them out on a sheet of paper so that you have them in front of you before you do your interview. So if you have a question, perhaps it asks you how you dealt with a situation where you disagreed with someone else's opinion, then you have the list of extracurriculars and experiences that you had to draw upon when you do the interview. Um, I just probably want to touch a bit more on what the format was because it wasn't an online interview in the sense where you're like Skyping someone or video calling someone like directly. It's typically someone asks a like, video question. So it's like pre-recorded. Someone just asks you a question and you just have to record your response. And I believe the whole interview application took like 30 minutes. It's either between 30 minutes and an hour. You'll get more information about that through the email that you receive. And you just have to answer your questions within that time frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Um, so we're going to wrap up like in a while. But um, one of the last questions is, what are some pros and cons, or like, like yeah, pros and cons um, about your program or your school? Um, OK, so I guess some pros about my school would be that um, it is a very like close knit community when you choose a program just because there's no like general year. Um, you like dive into whatever you really like. Like there will be some courses you're sort of like you're forced to take like chemistry um, in first year. But for the most part, a lot of them are interesting and apply to um, like computer engineering. So that's definitely a pro. Um, the, I guess another thing would just be, um, yeah, I guess the the fact that you're with, I, like it sounds weird and like very high school-y, but the fact that you're with the same people, I feel like you like really develop close bonds with these people. Um, so that's definitely another pro. And then also just co-op, I do think, although it can be stressful when you're applying and trying to study and like do midterms and you have like interviews, you're running back and forth all the time. Um, it can be stressful, but I think at the end of the day, it pays off and it's a good experience. Um, some cons, like one con, uh, like for me at least, um, was for us, like to the first term of second year was very difficult. We had, I think like eight courses, just that one term um, because they sort of try to like weed people out that term. So that's like your time to see if you're, you know, like, like if you'll make it essentially. Um, but I have heard that they actually changed the courses and distributed it more evenly now. Um, so I don't think you're going to have that like crazy hectic term. So for me, that was a con, but I think now it's, uh, more like balanced. Okay. I, oh, yeah. I would say for, uh, sorry, I would say for my school, um, a pro, I guess this is kind of like contrasting with what Aruj just said, but, um, we have a general first year, so you can see this as a pro or as a con, because when you have a general first year, you have to take courses that might not be within like the specialization that you want to take. So like if you don't really like physics and you're planning on going into like chemical engineering where you don't really need to take a lot of physics, you still got to take that in first year. And yeah, that kind of sucks. But having a general first year was really good if you're not sure about what program you want to go into right away. So some people really like um, having that extra year to figure out what they really like to kind of explore, so explore different topics a little more before they actually specialize into a program. I think another pro about my school is that we have a lot of like clubs and teams. So like typically in high school, I know that you don't really have like design teams. Like in university, we have design teams where you can design a concrete toboggan, a toboggan made out of concrete, or you can work on the design of like a race car. Um, that's a lot of experience that might be really helpful in determining what stream you want to specialize into in second year. So if you're able like with the general first year, and with all the curricul extracurriculars that you have at our school, it's really nice to like figure out what you really want to do in second year. So that's the general first year part. Um, and again, like I said earlier, I really want to stress this because this is what I really, really love about McMaster. It's just, again, it's the community. Like it's not just that you are able to reach out to upper years if, if you need their help. A lot of the times upper years make themselves really available for you to ask them questions. So it's this really type of like welcoming feeling at McMaster that I really, really love. 
Okay. Ditto. I just want to say, in case, I, <laughs> in case I make Waterloo sound bad, all of that applies as well. <laughs> yeah. all right. Okay, so the very last question we have um, is, what is the average annual cost of like, including tuition, fees, book, residence, and food, like everything, how much was like a general guess of how much you would spend in one year? Uh, so for me, first year with like residents and stuff um, was about 20k. So tuitions plus residents. Um, after that, it went down. Well, not like by a lot, but it was like 9000 um, per term. So 18,000 per year. Uh, yeah, it, it's like quite expensive. But you'll find that when you're paying fees and actually looking at them, there are some like random fees that show up so if you really want like you could like opt out of some of them so i think like the like the bare minimum that you could go to is probably probably like eight thousand um yeah yeah that was around the same for me last year so last year my tuition was around like 12 to fourteen thousand, and then residence was like eight thousand. but that also varies depending on the type of residence that you have so i had a, a residence that was slightly on the more expensive side, but if you have like a single room, double rooms, where you have like to share washrooms, that would like be less of a residence cost. Um, and then on top of that, textbooks. Since a lot of my textbooks I found on like I found online PDFs for, um, I was able to not spend as much on school supplies, but it still ended up totaling up to like two hundred dollars. I remember last uh, last year, so. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Mm -hmm. um, like first year, I wasted a lot of money on textbooks and then <laughs> learned the hard way that like you can find everything online. So um, yeah, so unless you're really into having like the actual book in front of you, I suggest just looking for stuff online. Oh, another tip for textbooks. Uh, I heard from upper years that if you really do like having a physical copy of textbooks, it is cheaper to just find the PDF and print out all the pages than it is to buy the actual book. So a little life hack for you. Oh, are, is it also cheaper to like trade books? I heard you could like yeah. trade your books or something. Is that, um, how does that work at your school? Well, at McMaster, we, it's not necessarily trading, uh, but it, uh, we have like Facebook groups for used textbook sales. So a lot of times upper, upper years who have like bought a textbook, they would resell their textbook for like a lower cost. So that's very, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we also have Facebook groups and then there's mm -hmm. also a used bookstore on campus that you can look at. That's, that's really helpful. Um, okay, so that's all the time we have today. So we are actually going to wrap up now. That is the end of Bright Pathways Day One. Thank you to everyone who came today, and we hope that you learned a lot from our guests today. We also want to thank our panelists, Tammy and Arush, for joining us today. Last thing, if you attend two or more of our webinars, you will automatically be entered into a draw to win a $20 gift card. So, that's Also, if you have any more questions that we weren't able to answer, you can always connect with Tammy and Arush through their socials that will be linked in an email that we will be sending out soon. If you're looking for more opportunities, just like um, our event today, you can still sign up for our three other webinars. And so you'll be able to find them in the same link in our bio on our Instagram. So for day two, it, it, it is on September 19th, featuring science students from Rice and Nursing, McMaster Medical Radiation Sciences, and Western Medical Sciences. Day three is on September 26th featuring business students from the University of Toronto Finance and Economics and Western's Ec Global Economics Program. And finally, day four is on October 3rd, and it will be featuring students from Ryerson Fashion Communications and OCAD Digital Painting and Animations. Again, if you still want to register for our other webinars, the link is in our Instagram bio. We'll be sending out emails shortly that will include a feedback form, which will be used in our webinar reflection post. So make sure to fill it out for a chance to get your comment featured on our page. We will also include the socials of our panelists in case there are questions that we weren't able to answer today or if you think of another question you would like to ask. So that's the end of day one and I want to thank all of you guys for attending our first ever event and make sure to follow all of our socials 
and check us out on YouTube. Stay tuned and we hope to see you all soon. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you for attending.